many parts of the world. The earth began to shake everywhere, in northern Italy, in the Philippines, worst of all in China and in Central America. In August 76, there were clear indications that the volcano La Soufrière on the Caribbean island of Guadeloupe was about to erupt. The mountain had emitted its first signs in spring that year and scientists had been flown in. Things began to take a dramatic turn towards the end of August. What was expected was no ordinary eruption, but an explosion of the whole volcano with a force of at least five or six atomic bombs. Thus, 75,000 inhabitants were evacuated from the surrounding volcano, the whole southern part of the island. I was immediately fascinated when I read in a newspaper that one single poor peasant living on the very slopes of the volcano had refused to be evacuated. The very same day I set out, together with my two cameramen, Jörg Schmidt-Reitwein and Ed Lackmann. Next day we were already in Basterre, on the southern tip of the island, a town of 17,000 inhabitants, which was most threatened. The place was completely deserted, but in their haste they had forgotten to switch off the traffic lights. Telephones were still working, and the air conditioning and refrigerators in many houses were still on. In one house we even found a TV set still operating. This is the police station. It was entirely abandoned. It was a comfort for us not having the law hanging around. Most of the shops had been cleared, but in frantic haste. This is a shoe shop. The silence was eerie, just a few doors banging in the wind and water dripping. Animals had taken over the streets. We came across donkeys, pigs, chickens and especially dogs. The dogs had gone without food for days. There was no more garbage to scavenge. They had even stopped barking. We found many of them starving and the place stank of carrion. It was as spooky as a science fiction locale. This is the pier, devoid of ships. Then the situation became very tense during the night. There was a seismic crisis marked by 1400 tremors and shock waves within 10 hours. The mountain seemed about to explode and the last of the scientists had fled in a boat. It was said that the catastrophe was inevitable within the next few hours. We set up an automatic camera at a distance of 25 miles which took these pictures. We flew over Basterre by helicopter. During the flight, we got the impression that these were the last hours of this town and the last pictures ever taken of it.
the sea was full of dead snakes. They had crawled down during the night by the thousands from the mountain jungles and fled into the sea where they promptly drowned. The quiet and deserted atmosphere of the town was so intense that we became fascinated and eager to take a look at the source of the silence, namely at the crater of the volcano itself. All along our path we came across warning signs. The greatest danger came from toxic gases. That day, the army roadblocks around an area of 30 miles in diameter had been so tightened that one could not even get through with special permission. We got around the roadblocks by sneaking across country in a car. Our path took us up to nearly 4,000 feet. The volcano itself is almost 4,500 feet high. For the first time, we began to get scared. Suddenly a toxic cloud of sulfur fumes ringing the mountain descended and it was all we could do to turn our car around on the narrow path. We hastily retreated a bit and waited. A few hours later things looked better because the wind turned. We decided to carry on. We followed the electric cables that led to the seismographs of the geologists. They had been set up right on the edge of the crater. The ground was hot and rather unsteady. At the top there were bottomless fissures 
from which hot sulfur fumes were pouring. We could approach from leeward and take pictures. The mountain had split 300 feet in length. Actually, we were able to film without anxiety for several hours. But as we turned back, our cameraman, Ed Lachman, discovered he had left his spectacles behind. We decided to pick them up the next day if the mountain still existed by then. The people of Guadeloupe, perhaps, were so aware of danger because in 1902 there had been a catastrophe in the neighboring island of Martinique. This is a photo of the town of Saint-Pierre in Martinique taken in 1901. There were 32,000 people living in Saint-Pierre. The town was the administrative and cultural center of the whole island. There was even a horse-drawn tram and an opera house. The town, like Basse-Terre, lay at the foot of a volcano, Montagne Pelée. Basically, the warnings emitted by the volcano were identical to those of La Soufrière. The population intended to flee, but since there was an election which had already been postponed for other reasons, the governor persuaded the people to stay. Only a few hundred left the town. All others remained. This is a photo taken on May 6, 1902, two days before the catastrophe. And this is the last picture taken before the catastrophe. The population had grown restless. Some of them gathered on the beach, still thinking of fleeing. Then, the next day this year, it is an actual photo, not a painting. A dead cow in the water, and to the right in the background, hard to make out, the half-sunken wreck of the Canadian ship Roraima. It had tied up to take on refugees. It sank with all hands and not one soul survived. In the town there was practically not a single stone left standing. All was silence. The horrified rescue teams found not a living soul. The people had been charred to a cinder, 30,000 dead in all. What had happened? There had been no usual outbreak of lava. The mountain had spouted a cloud of gas in an explosion of searing flame. The whole thing could only have taken seconds. This is a meal of spaghetti, burned to a cinder, on a plate. And here is a loaf of bread, turned into black coal. And then they found one survivor, just one. It was a young thief, Supari, who was in prison. The miracle of his survival is that he only survived because he was the baddest guy in town. There were about 60 to 70 prisoners besides him, but he was the only one that behaved so badly, continually fighting with the wardens, so that as punishment he was placed in an underground solitary confinement. When the blast of the heat struck, he threw himself to the ground and suffered severe backburns. 
Later he was exhibited as a sideshow attraction in an American circus and lived until 1956. Here is a photo of Separi in the hospital where he suffered for several weeks. The hours passed and the waiting began. The silence grew ever deeper and the volcano La Soufria shrouded itself in clouds. Nobody knew whether the eruption would happen in the next few minutes or the next day. And because one could not see a thing, the fear became anonymous. On that day, we found the man who had refused to leave the district and two others. We had to wake him up first. What's going on here? You have refused to leave the district, haven't you? Yes, I'm here because it's God's will. I'm waiting for my death, and I wouldn't know where to go anyway. I haven't a cent. I am poor. You're waiting for death. Yes, and no one knows when it will come. It is as God has commanded. He will not only take me to his bosom, but everyone else. Like life, death is forever. I haven't the slightest fear. Yes, because it's God's will, and no one can tell when death will come. Are you afraid? Not one bit. Why not? God takes everyone to his bosom, not just one, not just me. He has ordained this for us. Why don't you move out? Where should I go? Death waits forever. It is eternal. I am not afraid of dying. Aren't you afraid? Are you nothing? No, there is not a thing you can do. Tell me about the volcano, La Soufrière. La Soufrière, but it's not a contif. Yeah, the volcano, it's always up there above us. But the situation is very dangerous, isn't it? Sure it is, of course it's dangerous. But I'm staying here. What difference does it make? 
Non, je l'avais là. You know, it's really very dangerous around here. You're sitting on a powder keg. Mais oui, oui, oui. Oui, oui, mais quand même. Sure we are, but so are all of us, and it's God's will. That's what God said, and I'm not the slightest bit worried, not one bit. Why should I leave? I would only have to come back. Where could I go? Tell me something about your life. I'm at peace with myself, with what's inside me. I have nothing, nothing at all, and I'm waiting for death. You see, this is how I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a typhoon too that has been predicted. But I've lived through so many typhoons, they always report them beforehand. Typhoons come along in August and September. I've seen quite a few in my time. You're still young, you've never lived through one. What have you got to lose? Ah. Je suis saisi d'amour en le voyant si belle. Vivre sans plaisir, c'est une triste l'esclavage. Ici, en travaillant, je gagnerai mon pain. Accorde-moi ce tango, je vous dirai mon secret, mais surtout, ne vous manquez pas de moi, accorde-moi ce tango. Si vous saviez, chérie, mon cœur est abandonné, accorde-moi ce tango. Ce soir, j'ai besoin de rêves, surtout, ne vous manquez pas de moi. Accordez-moi ce tango. Très bien ça. Euh, non, je pas besoin de la mort. <rire> I'm not afraid of death. Here I am and I look after the animals all the time. They've left their cattle behind, so I'm looking after them. I'm saving them. Alors je vais débarrasser aujourd'hui. And if it gets much worse, if things get really bad, maybe I'll clear out today. I'd like to go and see my children again. They are in Point Apitre. I'd like to see them again. But I'm not afraid of dying. We all have to die someday. I'm 55 now and I'm not scared anymore. We all have to die, just like that. I have 15 children. One, two, three, 15 children. They've left. They went to Point Apitre. I sent them there. Where is La Souffrie actually? Where is the volcano? Could you point it out? We can't see it. Yes, back there, up there. Explain the situation to me. But I haven't got any instruments. I'm no specialist. I'm all on my own. There's nobody else left. It's pretty bad here. Are you scared? No. No, I'm not scared. Why not? No, Why should I be? We all have to die one day, and now I'm here. I'm here and I'm poor. I only have myself to look after. I could leave here. Everyone has fled.
Keep up your days, Jim. Keep up your day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not afraid of a single thing. You can take me with you to Point Apitre, if you like. But I could also walk to La Souffrière. You see, I can get up to my house that way. But if you'll take me to Point Apitre with you, I'll go along. The volcano did not explode. Days came and went. The signs of a catastrophe began to diminish. After some weeks, the population began drifting back to their homes in villages and towns. It will always remain a mystery why there was no eruption. Never before in the history of volcanology were signals of such magnitude measured, and yet nothing happened. will probably soon be forgotten. In my memory, it is not the volcano that remains, but the neglect and oblivion in which those black people live. pathetic for us in the shooting of this picture and therefore it ended a little bit embarrassing. Now it has become a report on an inevitable catastrophe that did not take place. <laughs> 